On this episode, we talk about bookstore marketing, hashtags, and recycling content. You ask questions, and I answer them. This is the Ask Gary V Show. Everybody, this is Gary Vay, Nerd Chuck, and this is episode 68 of the Ask Gary V Show. I'm on a little bit of a roll, three in a row. We started in 2015, very bumpy. And by the way, if we're lucky enough to continue this show into 2016, we will start that very bumpy, and 17, as January between CES, Sundance, the Super Bowl. I do two or three speeches every year in January because people are trying to pump up their company or do things right. Uh, so January's always a little tricky. The whole first four months is tricky. Uh, As you can tell, not as many peeps in the background this morning. Uh, A little early here to pump out Ask Gary V. Devoted to the Vayner Nation. I appreciate you guys. Uh, What else do I want to talk about? By the way, the two videos, I'm gonna link them up again, DRock, I'm sorry. But like, just feeling the Twitter video and obviously, I mean, you've seen the organic starting point for the one is greater than zero, so people are really appreciating that video. So, let's get into the show. Abram asks, how do you optimize the use of hashtags for campaigns? Hashtag. Abram, this is a great question. I think we can get very detailed uh, for the Vayner Nation on this. Uh, Hashtag culture is very, very important, specifically to Instagram and Twitter. So let's start there. That is really the two places that massively over index. At some level, Pinterest as well, less on Facebook. Um, You know, Tumblr for a while there was very, very important. So, but Snapchat, not at all. So, LinkedIn, not really. So you know, we're really talking, we're really talking Twitter and uh, and Instagram first and foremost. There's another question that's going to be on the episode and a couple questions where the guy used 17, 18 hashtags as his entire kind of post. I think hashtags are an incredible way to get discovered. I think it's important to um, think about it two ways. I think you're asking, how do I get my hashtag going? Right? I think, and and, and even if not. By answering that, it's going to help a lot of people here. So, you know, I have the Ask Gary V hashtag slash, you know, hashtag Ask Gary V, Ask Gary V show I use on Instagram and Twitter. But I'm really just using that for fans that are looking to go down the rabbit hole more than getting it away for awareness. You're saying for a campaign, and I think people really need to understand a couple things. Number one, hashtags are not ownable. Let's just, you know, I'm going for big, um, podcast listeners, I'm going for a big dramatic pause here. You should have seen the way I reacted. I'm just gonna do it again. And it's important that you understand this. It is insane to me that people in 2015 still think they can own a hashtag. I walk into tons of meetings where the brand's like, let's own the hashtag, get them. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? First and foremost, any hashtag you can create, tomorrow I can jump in and make a hashtag. So, you know, we can remember all the way to the infamous 2008 or 9 time when Skittles put out that hashtag and then people started putting things that were very crude against it because Skittles' homepage was a filter and a stream of everybody using the hashtag and then all of a sudden, you know, body parts and rude and crude things started showing up on their, uh, on their corporate page because there is no ownability around a hashtag. So my answer is this, flip it. Instead of trying to own or establish a hashtag for a campaign, look at the hashtags that are trending and very popular on the two main platforms already and try to figure out how to reverse into them by putting out your piece of content, storytelling, and then using three or four hashtags that are riding the wave, and I wrote about this a million years ago, riding the wave of a hashtag, one of my first mediums, I think. Um, and so, uh, that's the answer. You know, Reverse it, don't try to establish one, ride the wave of four or five that are working, that are tie in and be creative into what you're putting out. Leonard asks, you've talked before about recycling a tweet. But how about other content, such as a blog post? How often do you pull a piece from the archives to dust it off and republish? Leonard, great question. As a matter of fact, you know what, India, this is something we should actually probably consider outright and look back at like my old Vidler videos. I saw one that came up the other day that has clearly not been transcribed to YouTube. Like somebody popped up, I thought it was interesting. Anyway, my own little spiel there. Sorry, Leonard, let me answer your question. Um, I don't do it often. Um, but I've never had India, Steve's not here. We, we had a wine event last night, he's probably tired. Some people can't hang. Um, 
I haven't done it a lot though. What my team here is helping me do is make better pieces of content on current, current thoughts and I think a lot of you have noticed I use the Ask Gary V show now as a platform to have a show and then India, DRock, Stefan, and the rest of the team are looking for nuggets within it to then form bigger pieces of content. And so um, right now I'm using this show as let's call it the core and then satellite content, the written word content, the infographics, the slide shares, the animated GIFs and these really amazing two, three, four minute movie types that these guys are banging out are a byproduct of it. You know, you just kind of spurred, that's why I just yapped with India, the idea that we maybe need to look back at some of the 2007, 8, 9, 10 classic stuff and maybe put a new, you know, maybe we go through a hardcore 2.0 thing, right? Stop doing stuff you hate, 2.0, like, like, you know, though I've updated, you know, Lost and, and mm-hmm. I've used Breaking Bad or something. What did we use? Uh, yeah, House of Cards, that's good. Uh, anyway, so, you know, I think that, I think it's massively important that people look back at their old content and more importantly, I believe in context and time, of it, unless it's evergreen. I don't know what that was. It was more of this. Time. And so I would say what might be more important, my friend, is how do you take a piece of content that you put out today and then produce six or seven versions of that thought across the platforms in a very jab, 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 right hook standpoint where it's like, show, show, show it. You're right. Show it. Come on, it's beautiful. Um, you know, in respecting the context, so infographic for Pinterest, animated GIF for Tumblr, that would be what I'd most focus on. From Josh, hi Gary, if you were going to market a brick and mortar bookshop, where would you start? So Josh, first of all, this is a great question. Second of all, I really appreciate the love you've given me. Obviously, you put Thank You Economy in one of your, your Instagram's tremendous. Um, Obviously, the question was posted, so if you guys could uh, catch his name or slow it down, go back and watch it, go check out his Instagram. I think your Instagram is really tight. I mean, look, I've always said that marketing uh, doesn't fix your shit product. And, you know, now you're, now after being such a great guy, you're like, crap, where's he going with this? Being a bookstore in the traditional sense of the word is over, right? There's something called Amazon, it's chipping away, it's just starting. Let me say that one more time because I think people are confused. It's just starting. You know, the corrosion of people going to bricks and mortar for books has been on like Donkey Kong in an iPad, Kindle, and Amazon world. I think if I was to buy 17 bookstores out of bankruptcy and I had to do it, what I would do is I would turn them into a live event space where book selling was the secondary aspect of it. I would turn it into a coffee shop, I would talk it, turn it into a, a co-working space, I would turn it into an event spot, I would turn the physical, and the fun part is, guys, and this is a little preview of, I'm getting my hands into Wine Library a little bit, Wine Library's second floor that has a lot of square footage, I'm about to turn into an event space. So, I'm eating my own dog food on this one, so, you know, I would say the content that you're putting out on the gram, and I didn't have time to look at everything else you're doing, is really strong. But as you can imagine, is that going to make somebody want to buy a book from you for you know thirty to seventy percent more? Yeah, hippies like India, show her. You know, like she would do that, right? But like, that is a very no, no. Loving books is one thing, India. Going and spending seventy percent more, I can see you because I know you a little bit. Maybe doing that once in a actually, do you buy your books from Amazon? No, I buy my books from Alexander Book Company. Yay, streamless plug. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> so, you know, I, I think that, uh, I think that um, there are some hipsters out there, but they're not going to drive your bottom line, right? That's the anomaly, not the standard. And so, you know, I've done the show for a little while now, and I would say that India and Stefan's head nodding as I was giving that answer was a really good indication that we're barking up the right tree here. So I would sell 30 to 50% less books to clear up the square footage within the store, no matter how big you are, 100 square feet, 1,000 square feet, 5,000 square feet, to really activate the physical location and find other ways and means to, uh, to, to make dollars because I think book selling within a bricks and mortar needs to be the secondary income, not the first, uh, play and that, I think that's something people need to wrap their head around. By the way, real quick, don't finish the editing. That is pretty much my theory on retail, period. Like multi-use, you know, events, experiential. Um, McDonald's, a lot of people talking about McDonald's, like I think they need to triple down on the playground thesis, right? You know, like so, 
I mean, I don't know. They've, the people have got to realize retail's in a very new place. Just leaving this message because you wanted some feedback. Uh, just got out of the gym training for a strongman competition. Shameless self-promotion for my startup company, HaggleChamp.com. Here's my big question. How do I overcome my people-pleasing nature? So that's, um, that's, an, easy, that's an easy answer. Um, you don't. You've been told by society and your homies that, uh, that it is your weakness. And I will tell you that it is your strength. What your weakness is is that you don't know how to throw a right hook. I am all people-pleasing culture nature and I'm building my entire empire on it. As a matter of fact, my, my new, I've been talking about The Bridge or The Contradiction as my autobiography, but now the big book that I want to write is The Human Empire, right? How to build an empire of like good feelings with good people and like think like that kind of thing. And so I think what you're in is you're stuck in the jab, 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 jab business. And so my intuition based on your question is it's not about fixing your people. As a matter of fact, I triple down on that. I want 34 more jabs um, from you, but where you're missing the boat is going in for the right hook. And so you need to grow a sack and ask for the biz. Jason asks, as a B2B manufacturer of building products, how much time and money should we spend on marketing to consumers versus customers? Or am I better off trying to brand myself as an expert and a resource and let people figure out what we can do to add value? Jason, uh, first of all, let's, let's, D Rick, let's put the picture back right now and let's circle the cow. I'm scared crapless of that cow. Just wanted to get that out there. Completely scared. Um, you know, I think, I think you've got an answer. You know, it's funny. A lot of times people say to me that I lead the question. In business meetings, I'm asking a question, but really I'm just trying to make you tell me what I want to hear. You just did that. Like, yes, the answer is yes. You should become the expert. Put out content with scary ass cows and dominate and put it out there and let it be a gateway drug and kind of a breadcrumb to what you're doing. And so that's it, man. Content rules the world. You know, like, you know, I, it just does. Like, I. I just thought of Lauren Hill. Did, did it sound like Lauren Hill when I said content rules the world? Like, I don't know, I felt a little. Anyway, I think, uh, I think that uh, that is the way to go about it. Um, I'm a big fan of becoming the honey and letting the bees come to you. Uh, and I think that that is what great content is today. Watching Tony Robbins retweet uh, yesterday's, you know, one is greater than zero video and then seeing the new CMO of Hyatt uh, reply to it because you saw it from Tony and then seeing the president of Cinnabon respond to her because of her reaction is word of mouth, content marketing, social media execution 2015. Bitches. Um, question of the day. That cow scared the shit out of me. What animal scares the crap out of you? You keep asking questions, I'll keep answering them. As a matter of fact, I tripled down on that. I want 34 more jabs um, from you, but where you're missing the boat is going in for the right hook. And so you need to grow a sack and ask for the biz. Mm -hmm.